Tim is going to be back here for worship service. Come and worship the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Thank God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. And the word of God builds faith in our lives. So Thursday, 7 p.m., be praying for the services. Okay. And uh, let's go ahead and look to the Lord in prayer. We'll ask his blessing upon this Bible study tonight. And Reverend Coker, we can pray for you, sir. Thank you, Father. We come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for this Bible study. Help Pastor Coke as he teaches your word, Lord. And keep your hand upon each and every one. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, I like that hat. What a hat. We're in the book of Acts chapter 2, and we are going to uh, do a little bit of review. We covered this last week, but we'll go over it again. Okay, we're going to be in verse 24. We'll start there. Let's read that together. And in speaking of Jesus, whom God had raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Okay, so God has victory even over death. Okay? And Jesus willingly laid his life down. I, I understand, we know that they crucified him. But as we're going to read in some scriptures that we have here, they only were able to do that because he allowed it to happen. Okay? No one could take it from him, but he willingly gave up his life. Okay? All of us are going to naturally die. That's just part of life, unless the rapture takes place. Okay, but we're going to live eternally with the Lord. That's not the end of it, really. That's just the beginning. Amen. Yes. Okay, remember when you graduated from school, they call it a commencement. That's like, right. Wait a minute. I'm finishing school. How is this just the beginning? Right. And now we know how it's just the beginning. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Maybe wish we could go back <laughs> before we paid bills and had responsibilities and uh, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, really, when we pass away, when we leave this life, and it's appointed that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment, we're all going to pass away unless the rapture takes place, and we're going to give an account to God for our lives. Thank God we're saved. Okay, our justification is the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. But um, when that takes place, brother and sister, we are going to live eternally with the Lord. You know, we miss people when they pass away. Okay, if they're saved, though, if a person is saved, they're a Christian. Okay, we 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 still miss them, but we don't have to be sorrowful because truly, as we like to say, well, they're better off. Well, a Christian that passes away is definitely better off. Okay, they're not bound uh, by this flesh in this world anymore. Okay, so let's look at some scripture that backs up that Jesus willingly laid his life down. Okay, therefore doth my father love me, John 10 and 17, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Okay, so John 19 and 10, Jesus was uh, before Pilate, the governor of Judea, the Roman governor. Okay, and uh, Pilate was asking him many questions. Okay, so let's look at what uh, Jesus' response to Pilate was. Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, okay, except it were given thee from heaven above. <coughs> Excuse me, given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Okay? Romans 6 and 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have the gift of eternal life. We are saved. Okay, we have hope in that. Yes. Speaking of Jesus here. Okay, now, did Jesus ever sin? I'm going to ask you that question before I read this verse. No. He never did. 
So if the wages of sin is death, okay, did Jesus um, deserve to die? No. He did not. You know what? He would not have died if he had not taken our sin upon him. Okay? The Bible said he became sin who knew no sin. Yes. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. Yes. So literally, Jesus did not die because of any wrong or any sin that he did. Okay? It's maybe hard for us to fathom in our mind, but even you, 2,000 years later here, he took your sin yes. upon himself and the sin of all of mankind. And he paid our price in judgment. They were going to read a verse of scripture here in just a moment. It says, um, thou, thou will not leave my soul in hell or suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Jesus literally paid our price in hell. Okay. He literally went to hell for you. Yes, he did. He paid our price. He did, sir. Okay. So let's go ahead and continue on here. Okay. So 1 Peter 2 and 22, speaking of Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. You know, James teaches us about being able to control the tongue and how when we can learn to control our tongue, we are mature, a perfect Christian. Yeah. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Jesus didn't even have any guile in his mouth. Yeah, there was not even any bitterness. Now, he did. You know, you read and you study the Gospels. He did absolutely uh, correct. Okay? And there were times that he used sharpness in his correction. Okay? He even told people things like, you're of your father the devil. We're of Abraham. You're of your father the devil. Okay? And, uh, you know, so there were times that he did correct and he did say things that were rebukes. But he did not do it out of any guile. Okay, there was no, it wasn't done out of hatred. Amen. It wasn't done out of malice. Okay. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Okay. So he not he had no no guile in his mouth, and he did no sin. First John 3 and 5, and you know that he was manifested, talking about Jesus, to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. Okay, we're showing you, what are you trying to do? We're trying to lay some groundwork to show you, and we've already stated it, okay, that uh, Jesus didn't die because he deserved it. He didn't die like we do because we've sinned and come short of the glory of God. He died in our place and for our sin, okay? 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hebrews 4 and 15, this to me is very comforting, okay? For Jesus lived in human flesh just like you and I, though he did not commit sin. He lived in a human body just like you and I. Okay? He was born in Bethlehem of a virgin. He lived, he grew up, he lived just like we uh, lived in this life. Okay, and look what Hebrews 4 and 15 says about him. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. It's telling us there that our high priest is talking about Jesus. The book of Hebrews is making a comparison between Jesus, the Levitical priesthood, the sacrifices under the law and all those things. And they were all representations of him and what he would do. Okay? So Paul in that book is teaching Hebrew believers the purpose of the law and all that was therein. It was to show us Christ. And you can look at Galatians okay, for that teaching also. It was to bring us to Christ. It was a schoolmaster. Okay? So Jesus, you know, my high priest is not Aaron. Okay, back in the Old Testament. Amen. It's not some other high priest throughout the history of the nation of Israel. Our high priest is Jesus himself. Yeah. Yeah. He is your go-between. Okay, he is your intercessor. And our high priest, okay, he can be touched with the feelings of that double negative there. 
Okay? He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. That means he can relate to our weakness because he lived in human flesh also. Okay, there were times that he was tired. There were times that he was thirsty. There were times that he was hungry. There were times that he was tempted in the flesh. The Bible tells us he is tempted at all points as we are, yet without sin. So there's nothing that you face that Jesus cannot relate to that he doesn't go through, that he didn't go through or face. Matter of fact, I would say that his temptation is far greater than ours because yes. he was literally tempted of the devil personally. Yes. Okay? Literally came to him and tempted him personally. Okay. So let's go on, let's go on and read here. Okay. But was in all points tempted like as we are, Hebrews 4.15, yet without sin. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. So he's got victory over death. And we have victory over death through him. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our own self-righteousness. Through our own ability. No. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Huh? You laid that burden off. Yeah. You know, I've come to the Lord and I put my faith in Him. And I'm endeavoring to follow Him. He understands. And I'm not making an excuse for sin. Sin is wrong. We know that. But He understands what we go through. What we face. And he's trying to help us. Yes, he is. You know, if God was against us, we wouldn't be here. That's right. That is the truth. Or read the Bible that, that, of societies and, and times in human history where God got mad at people. Okay? God flooded the whole earth. God rained down fire and brimstone out of heaven. Okay? He's trying to help us. Okay, and, and he does. He can. Amen? Okay. So we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go to verse 25 now. Okay. For David speaketh concerning him. He's talking about Jesus. David spake concerning Jesus. David uh, wrote this, okay, but he was not speaking about himself. It's written in Psalm, okay, 16, but David wasn't speaking about himself. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad, and moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because I will not leave my soul in hell, neither suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance, men and brethren. Okay? He's going to go on and tell us that uh, that is not written concerning David. David wasn't talking about himself being left in hell. Okay? He was talking about the Lord, the Holy One. Okay? He was prophesying about him. Okay, let's go ahead and look at verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. So David, like any other man, sinned, and he died. And they buried him. All right? And his grave is still there, though he came out of the grave. Okay, Jesus resurrected, and then those Old Testament saints resurrected after him. So now David's in heaven, okay, with the rest of the saints, people that put their faith in God. Maybe we have a hard time understanding that. Okay, we look back 2,000 plus years to what happened on the cross, right? We put our faith in what Jesus did. That's how we are saved. They looked forward to what he would do when he came. Maybe we could think about it that way. We see people like David and others in the Old Testament following God. Why did they follow God? 
because they, just like you and I, believed in the promises of the Word of God. Amen. Okay? They looked forward, we look back. So David looked forward and he followed God. Well, he wasn't perfect. Are we? He needed grace and mercy just like you and I. He needed Jesus to come and die for his sin just like you and I. Okay? Now, they couldn't go to heaven until Jesus came because it had not been paid for yet. But when Jesus paid the price for their sin, God led them out of that Abraham's bosom that you can read about. Okay? And he took them to heaven. Okay? He went first and they came after him. Okay? And so, um, what, what it's dealing with here, so let's go ahead and and go on now to verse 30. Okay, he's talking about David being a prophet. Therefore, David, or therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus... Have God raised up. Wherefore we are all witnesses. He's telling us specifically there exactly who it's talking about. It's talking about Jesus being raised up. Okay, and and, and uh, that if you study the lineage of, of the Lord, he was what of the tribe of Judah, just like David. Okay, we go on and and uh, you know we know that after David was Solomon, and then. You had Rehoboam, and the kingdom was divided after that. But you keep going, and we, we see an end to it. They were carried away captive. They don't have a king in Israel right now. Okay, the nation was reestablished in 1948. They have a prime minister. But there's no king, a natural king, sitting over them. But Jesus is seated in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. Oh, yes. And he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yeah. Okay, so that promise was fulfilled. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's go on here. Okay, we have some scripture there for you. I'm trying to cover some ground tonight. So let's go to verse 34. Okay, you've got your study guides. You can uh, look at that. Let's go to verse 34. Okay, for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, "The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand." David is ascended now because those Old Testament saints, okay, when Jesus came out of the grave, they came out after him, okay? Until I make thy foes thy footstool, okay? So David is not the one who ascended and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. That's Jesus, okay? It's not saying that David didn't go to heaven. He did, but Jesus is the one that is seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is the one that this prophecy was referring to. He is the one that intercedes for you and I. He is the Lord in Christ. He is the Messiah that Israel waited for and David prophesied about. He was the one that, that they crucified. Okay, let's go now to now, let's read verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Okay, so he's telling them He's showing them from their own scripture, okay, that Jesus was the Christ, not only that David spoke of there in Psalm 16, but all of the prophecies about him. He fulfilled all of them. He is the one that was promised. And what did they do to him? They took him and they crucified him. Okay, so now we want to look at their response to what Peter just said. Now, if you want to look at another example of this with a different response, okay, we could go forward and we could go to Acts chapter 7, and there's a man there by the name of Stephen that did a similar thing, but he even covered more of the Jewish history. Okay, he basically, he started with Abraham and came all the way through their history, okay, and showed them how that, that they had crucified their Lord and how they were wrong. He did it with the intention, just like Peter is doing here, to try to get them to turn away 
from the wrong that they've done and turn to God and accept him. In this instance, they're going to. In the instance with Stephen, they did not. They got so mad that they killed Stephen. They stoned him with stones. They even got so mad that they ran upon him and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Okay? But, G but Stephen kept his eyes on the Lord. Okay? And, he's, and the Bible tells us that he saw, you know, we're reading here that he seated, Jesus is seating up, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Over there in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 7, you read about Stephen. He saw the Lord standing at the right hand of God the Father. We like to say that Jesus gave him a standing ovation. That's right. And uh, ushered him into heaven. Yes. Because he stood for the Lord. Yes. Jesus said, you're going to stand for me, I'm going to stand for you. Yes. Okay? Anyway, let's, let's go, let's look at this here. Let's look at the response to Peter's sermon. Let's look at verse 37. Okay, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so you're telling us we crucified the Messiah. We're not right. They didn't get mad. Okay, what do you, what do you want? What, what should I do? What do I do? I was talking to Reverend Coker. Uh, I think it was Reverend Coker I was talking to today. We were driving. Maybe it was today we, we shared this. We were talking about uh, Gloria Soto and how that she was a very intelligent woman. She was involved in a lot of things that uh, to, were blessings to the community. You would have probably never known it. She didn't talk a lot about it here. Okay. And uh, found out a lot of it when we had her funeral. Okay. A lot of people came forward and mentioned all that she had done, community centers, improvements in the community. Okay. Uh, just uh, uh, trying to help people. Okay. But uh, she was very involved in that and successful in that. Okay. But she came to church and she heard about Jesus. She didn't depend on her own good works in the community to save her. She came to, to us one time. We even went to her house, even sitting here in that pew. She used to sit right, right there with Debbie, sit somewhere around in there. And I'd go back and Gloria, you want to pray? Yes. More than what she'd asked me. I just want to make sure. What do I need to do to be right with God? Yes. What must I do to be saved? Yes. I agree. Okay, and we, we told her. And she went to be with the Lord. Amen. And I believe beyond any shadow of a doubt that she's there in his presence. Yes. Okay? Because like these people, and like we need to be. Okay, what do I need to do? What must I do to be right with God? Okay? They asked the question. And they asked it in response to Peter's sermon and the reproof of the Spirit of the, of the, and the Word of God. There was a humility and a godly fear. Okay? All right. So I'm, you know, Something's not right. Let me not let me not make excuses. What do I need to do to make it right? Okay. And guess what? Peter told him. Let's go to verse 38. Okay. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, This is the first thing he said to them. The first word. What's the first word that he uses? You see it there in your Bible. Repent. Repent. He didn't say. We're going to baptize you in water. That's going to save you. No, it yeah. doesn't save you. <laughs> he said, repent. The message hasn't changed. Okay? God wants us to turn away from sin in our life, our self-will. God wants us to turn to him and submit ourselves to his will for our life. To surrender. The Apostle Paul is another example. Acts chapter 9. Okay, the Lord stopped him. He fought against the church. He was the ringleader of the people that killed Stephen that we just talked about. He 
fought against the church big time. The Lord stopped him. He was on his way to arrest Christians and haul them off. He tried and uh, put to death. Okay? But God intervened and stopped him and told him, basically, it's hard for you to fight against me. And Paul responded, Who art thou, Lord? He knew. I got a voice talking to me out of heaven. I need to listen. Who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, who you persecute. You're fighting against me. You know what he said? He said, what will thou have me to do? Right there, he surrendered. What do you want me to do, God? And the Lord told him, and he started doing what the Lord told him to do. It's no different with you and I. Okay? Peter told him to repent. Okay? Confess and turn away from your sin and turn to God. It is more than believing that Jesus exists. You know, when I was a kid, I used to have people ask me all the time, you know, people, we, back in the day when we were younger, they had church buses that would come by on the weekend. A lot of churches did that. There'd be different churches that would come through the neighborhood, church bus. They'd ask you, do you believe in Jesus? Well, yeah, I believe in Jesus. If they would ask me if I was following him, that was a different answer. <laughs> of course I believe that he existed. That's right. But it's more than believing that he exists. Yeah. Okay? We have to take this scripture in context with other scripture. You don't build a teaching on one verse of scripture. Okay? We have some scripture there for you that, that deals with there needs to be more than one witness to establish something. Okay, and then also James 2 and 18. Yea, a man may say that thou hast faith, I have works, show thee my faith without thy works, and I will show thee by my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But without no vain man that faith without works is dead. We need to believe to the extent that we act upon what we believe. Like they did. They believed what Peter was saying. And they said, hey, what must we, must we do to be saved? And he told them. Okay, be baptized. First they would repent. Then he says to them, be baptized. Okay, repent. Okay, that's the first thing. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Okay, now he's not saying that the baptism remits the sins. Okay? Amen. That's not what he's saying. He's telling them that they're to be baptized to show that their sins have been remitted. Okay, the word, okay, for, okay, for the remission of sins, that word in the Greek is the word Ice, it's E I S. Okay? And it means because. So we could say be baptized because your sins have been remitted. Yes. Yes. You repented it, you put your faith in Christ. Your sins are remitted. Be baptized because your sins are remitted. Okay? Baptism is an outward okay, testimony of an inward work. I got, I got saved. I knew I was saved because God changed me. Yes. Yeah. I was brought to a point of decision just like these people. And I decided, like Paul, to stop fighting God. And I told God, I said, I don't want to be this way anymore. I literally told him that. And I surrendered, and he came into my life. Yeah. And I changed. Yeah, I was born again. And it wasn't until, I was out in the middle of a desert. I know we're in the desert here. <laughs> but we have water, plumbing. Then we go to college. We have plumbing. <laughs> water piped in. And there's swimming yes. pools and places you can go to get baptized. And, I mean, I was out in the wilderness kind of desert where there is no water. 
No, they, they brought it cases of water, liters, bottles of water for us to drink. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, amen. <laughs> okay. There was no water for me to be baptized in, but I was saved. Amen. And then later on, because I wanted to be baptized, I talked to a chaplain, and there were obviously other people that God was saving out there. They made a way. They got a big water tank, and they filled it with water. They got a, a water tanker and brought water, and they filled up this rubber water tank about the size of a small round pool. They'll use it to store water out in the desert in the military. And guess what? They baptized us in that thing. Yeah. Okay? So the water baptism, it is a commandment, and we are to be baptized in water. But the water baptism doesn't save you. It's your repentance and faith in Christ. You turning to him. You accepting him as, listen, listen to this title, Lord, Savior. Okay? So we're over time. We've got some food back there for you. And we're not, you know, the things that we teach you, we're not picking on anyone. We love you. Okay, God loves you. We, we want to know what the Bible actually teaches so we can come to God the correct way. We come to him. We repent. We have faith in him. And you know, he's the one that said, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. His yes. word declares that. Hallelujah. If yes. we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes. So you ask Jesus to forgive you, he did. Yes. Keep your faith in him. Okay, and endeavor to follow him. If you have a failure in your life, which at times we all do. I've had failures in my life. Who hasn't? The Apostle Paul said he's not obtained. He's pressing toward the mark. Okay? We've all had failures. But the thing to do is to realize, you know, I have a high priest that can be touched with the feeling of my infirmity. Yes. And I can come to him. And he's seated right there at the right hand of God the Father to make intercession for me. So that when I need help, he's going to help me. Okay? When I need forgiveness, he is faithful and just. Okay? You know, somebody that's faithful, you can count on. You can count on Jesus. He is just. He's not two-faced. He's not going to tell you he's going to do something and not do it. He said he would forgive. He does. Amen. Okay, so let's trust him. Okay, continue to look to him. And uh, we've got some uh, taco salads in the back. You know, come eat with us. We'd love to fellowship with you. We need that. I know that I know what's out there. We don't live in some bubble. Okay. Thank God we can draw strength and encouragement from one another. Yes. Okay, so let's go ahead and dismiss the Bible study tonight. Fellowship in the back and Brother Collins will you dismiss us. Father God, we thank you for the time we can spend together here with you, Lord, and for each one that you brought here tonight, God. Thank you for the lesson, Lord. Help us to use what we've learned here, God, to just to be better Christians, Heavenly Father. And as we leave here, Lord, we ask you to keep us in your word. Keep us reaching for you, Lord. And thank you for all that you do, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.